10 second security tip, go. So for any network device that you buy, purchase, given to you for any other things, always, always change both the account if possible and the password that's actually there. We see constant attacks going against these devices and becoming botnets and everything else. Putting anything on the internet is extremely dangerous using default accounts. It's time to begin the CISO Security Vendor Relationship Podcast. Welcome, everybody, to the CISO Security Vendor Relationship Podcast. My name is David Spark of Spark Media Solutions. My co-host is Mike Johnson, who is the CISO of Lyft. Mike, once again, we're up to episode number five, and I will say... After every episode, I get lots of great responses. I hope you've been hearing good things, yes? I've been hearing great things. Well, excellent. That's awesome. (laughs) And Richard Rushing, who is the CISO of Motorola Mobility, he is our uh, guest for today's podcast, who I've quoted multiple times in previous articles. Thank you so much for being part of our uh, episode. My pleasure. Thanks for inviting me. I really appreciate it. Let's just get into this. How CISOs are digesting the latest security news. Our first story is a third of UK organizations have sacked employees for data breach negligence. Now, this comes from research from Shredded Security Tracker report and combined was a look at how much security awareness training employees got, like public Wi-Fi use and spotting fraudulent email. It was far from 100% that got this training. So I'll ask both of you, actually, Mike and Richard, uh, have you ever sacked an employee because of data breach negligence? HR is usually the one that deals with sacking employees out of that. I think one of the big issues that I always have when it's talking about this or phishing exercises or other things with termination of employees and everything else, you really need to have a clear intent model. And I think data breaches are very along the same lines. But in some of these cases where a zero day vulnerability was used or something along those lines, how are you going to follow into that? But I do agree with you in the study that was actually done that training is should be almost mandatory and should be covered on an annual basis as well as kind of care and handling. We do it for things such as chemicals, waste, toxic things that are dangerous to human nature should be the same level and capability should be done for those training for privacy issues around data itself. Well, so I I think, um, and, and Richard was talking about this a little bit, is there's really kind of two categories of actors when we're talking about employees with a, related to a data breach, one is the malicious in nature, so the the Tesla employee that he mentioned, and the other is is innocent or potentially negligent, where uh, an employee clicks on the wrong thing, or you know they plug in a USB or something like that. And I, I think a lot of those, it's not really fair to sack the employees if one action by one employee is the only thing standing between uh, your co- your company's most critical data and some outside attacker. Uh, so I, I would actually have a hard time in the case of someone accidentally doing something, having to have that conversation with HR. Uh, but certainly if it's malicious in nature, uh, no hesitation, that different thing. Yeah, yeah. Malicious is a different yeah. This is about negligence, though. This is definitely about negligence. So there's, and, and you bring up an interesting point that, you know, if it's just negligence, there should be sort of other sort mm-hmm. of uh, lines of defense in place, correct? Um, but uh, can you give me some more specifics of like, what is the nature of something that happens that where someone purely on negligence, we're not talking about maliciousness, but purely on negligence they are sacked for that reason. Does it, again, does it have to happen more than once? Are they truly not, you know, taking any care of the, and was it a case, is there ever a case where they were never trained and they were negligent and sacked or 
Does that not happen? Yeah, I'd, I'd have a hard time uh, in that case, right? If, if someone was never trained and they one time did one bad action or one negligent action, I'd, I'd have a hard time with termination around that. But you know, maybe if it was gross negligence repeated over and over and over again, that would be something that might merit that sort of a conversation. But that's not something that I've run across in the past. The next story is very much related, and this is also a research study. Uh, younger employees identified as, quotes, main culprits of security breaches. Now, this is research from Centrify, and the, the main cul- culprits is in quotes because this isn't actually the statistic, but is what older people think of younger, this 18 to 24 people. There is a lot of fear of them being online and sharing too much information via sh- social. So... Is this just an old story with new dressing, the older generation simply not getting the younger generation, or is the younger generation's use of technology truly a security risk? Mike? I'm going to go with the the same level of facts as, you know, the people behind this article. I I don't think so. You know, I I think this really is just, you know, is just an old story with new dressing. I'm Gen X. I, I remember growing up the way that my parents' generation thought that you know, what we were going to amount to and the way that we were constantly looked down upon. And so I I think this is just another avenue of where older generations are looking at what's what the generation is that's coming along and just assuming they're not as good as whatever current generation is. But so you don't believe that the way the younger people are sharing a lot of content online that their behavior is not creating an an additional security risk for your company. No, I don't think so. I, I think the the reality is that a lot of the the younger folks are actually more aware of what's going on with the information behind the scenes than perhaps older generations are. You know, it's they they grew up on technology. I actually would agree with that. Richard, how do you feel? These social platforms and things like that that people are sharing at some point People are just overlooking it. They're not doing the details of it in, in some of those other areas. I could tell you where areas that I am usually concerned about for kind of the, um, if you want to call it the, the the younger generation, and I think some of those evolve around software and code sharing functionality that's there, uh, GitHub uh, and some of the repositories of people moving software around and everything else uh, around that, some of the open source development areas. And I think those are common areas that if you're really concerned about that or that's something that your organization is doing, that's a good area to kind of look out for and maybe provide additional training for employees around that because that's a common cultural aspect that we see with them sharing information or way things are actually done around that. Why is everyone talking about this now? Robert Herjavec, who is one of the sharks on the TV show Shark Tank, so not a security guy, uh, wrote an article on LinkedIn entitled, Who Has Your CEO's Credentials? Which the article pretty much makes a call that all companies should be using privileged account and identity solutions of some sort. Um, And what I thought was intriguing, there was a lot of engagement on this article, a ton of engagement. It may have to do with a celebrity post-show addendum, this could also be because he owns a security company. Back to the show. But I know you guys have probably seen this happen where people at, you know, C-level status are giving out their credentials to assistants and other employees to manage their accounts for them. Let me ask you guys, with privileged account and identity management in place, does this kind of behavior still happen that you're sharing credentials? So I I think for a lot of the systems applications and platforms we use these days there's a lot of delegated responsibility models that are available so for instance my ceo can grant his uh, assistant access to his calendar not that he has to give give the ea the ability to directly log in as him uh, and I, I think there's a, a lot of other platforms and systems and capabilities where there's just not that need uh, as much anymore. Uh, and so I, I haven't seen it happen in, you know, at Lyft, I've seen it happen before previous roles, previous experiences where 
the tools didn't exist, but it actually has gotten much more difficult in our modern era of 2FA everywhere that not only do you have to share a password, you have to share a 2FA token and having a single 2FA token work for two different people is actually really difficult to do. Uh, so I, th I think we're seeing less and less of this. Richard, are you finding this behavior still happening? No, I think it's, uh, I agree with Mike. I think with the new systems, delegation is almost always built into the process. And a lot of times this is not necessarily for the simple fact of CEOs giving their admins accounts. It's the fact that, yeah, in some cases, people need to be able to take vacations. So I, I have to give somebody signing responsibility or uh, approval responsibility at the same levels of that. And I think that's come into the play. And just like Mike brought up, with the advent of two-factor authentication and environments, now it's it, it's now a whole different ballgame to try to share identities um, around the same area that's actually there. And it becomes super difficult to basically be able to do that and not end up locking the accounts out or doing something else that's around there. One of the things I also want to bring up about this article is the fact that it was written by a non-security person, but who is a celebrity. I noticed that a lot of the people who responded to it were non-security people. So like an assistant, real estate developers, a roofer, salespeople. In terms of sort of spreading the the need for security awareness, do you guys believe and have you seen cases of this where a non-security celebrity is able to get through to the non-security audience? I mean, and do you think that's critical for sort of awareness within the, the community? Any enlightenment that can be done is is still enlightenment. And I think regardless of who it comes from, the simple idea, I would love to have People expound the usage of two-factor authentication from a private, personal email, Facebook, any of the social media platforms, anything that support it, going back to the same thing. It, it, keeps, it keeps the whole environment uh, clean. You don't end up with everything from celebrity breaches and everything else. And you can look at that as being, hey, these people have... A lot to lose and they have lost it not only once but multiple series of times due to poor security practices and i think anything that can push the security bubble a little bit higher i'm, I'm all for it i would assume you're for it but more i think my question i'll ask you mike is i mean i just see that security people themselves often talk to other security people like they don't break out of that shell. I mean, we're all kind of in sort of an incestuous environment and, and it's great that we're all educating ourselves and, and that's wonderful. But to get this to bleed out to others, my feeling is that there needs someone who has sort of a non-security brand, but cares about security and is a, a celebrity of some sort to be able to reach the masses. Because I, I, I fear that security people alone can't reach the masses. Am I, am I wrong in this thinking? No, I, I don't think you are. And, and part of it is actually just simply numbers. There's not as many security people to go around as I think we would all like. I, th I think it'd be really interesting if someone who has a lot of reach on social media, like what would happen if Katy Perry said, hey, all my followers, please go set up 2FA and here's this link that shows you how to do it. It would actually be an interesting experiment to see if that paid off. And my suspicion is it would actually go over really well. And we would see that uptick far more than uh, those of us in the security industry who have just based on numbers and, and our reach, you know, limited, uh, limited exposure and limited audience. Yeah, that's a good point. I, but it's only a matter of time, by the way, Mike, when you have the same kind of Katy Perry power <laughs> and effect. <laughs> I'll, I'll uh, look for my uh, own left shark when I get there. <laughs> yeah. New segment. Please. Enough. No. More. So there are topics in security that get beaten down like a dead horse, but we still talk about it because there's still lots more to uncover on the subject. So I'm going to ask you guys, I'm, I'm just going to pick a topic here. And I'm interested to know what you think has been abused on this topic and what you would love to hear more about. And let's, because we talked about it just earlier, is that's that of identity management. 
where where do you think you've you've heard enough on that subject and where would you like to hear more about it so i'm i'm putting on my lift colored glasses here and I, i've really heard enough about active directory and managing permissions in active directory i know a lot of people have challenges around that but for every you know 10 or 100 messages i get for someone offering or a solution out there to help out with active directory there's one message to help out with cross platform environments where you have more than just windows or you're a heavy mac shop or maybe you're very heavy in the cloud and you're g suite and you know i i haven't seen much on here's a good solution a good way of managing identity across multiple platforms rather than the classic hey everyone's got ad right <laughs> i i must say that the majority i've heard is on active directory as well richard do same or, or a different story i think it's one of the things i think uh i think identity management is is kind of the same thing but i i always break it down into two areas you have identity management and then you have access management and they're two separate things and unfortunately a lot of the vendors are like identity and i'm like okay yeah those are depending on who won the directory wars back in the 80s for your organization or you never had the directory war so you end up with multiple things or like mike pointed out you're in the cloud uh, in these organizations and it has a better authentication service than you have internally there there's always these things and i think one of the the things that i'm kind of tired of is that the big thing for identity management and access management that trumps everything is the user experience at the end mm -hmm. of the day if i make my user have it's difficult for them or the two-factor uh, support for them is is really really bad for some strange reason uh, you pick something out of the out of i don't know the 70s or something like that where you it's not a single push of a button or you know i decided to put in a 13 character token for you to retype or something uh, if i've messed that user experience up i'm never going to win at this and i think that's one of the key things that's never kind of brought in and thought about is at the end point is how do i make that user experience simple and easy to use so they'll actually use it and be happy with it instead of trying to fight that functionality because you will end up having it to say yeah if i didn't make it difficult and i made it super hard you're not going to be able it's not going to win like you need it to win and that's part of the issue too is that we really need stronger authentication in these environments and if i'm not making it easy for my users, I'm never going to get the stronger authentication that I need to survive. Yeah. So I actually want to change my answer and, and actually steal from Richard there because, I, you know, the what we're not hearing enough about is making strong, strong identity management, strong authentication. We're making it easy. We don't hear enough about that. And I'd like to hear more. What do you think of this pitch? All right, this comes from Christine Ockerbloom, who is a manager at Cobalt, and she has just a, uh, a flat pitch from the, them, and it's, it's pretty tight and it's dense, so let's hear it. Cobalt has created the industry's first PTAAS, pen testing as a service, or PTAS, I guess we would pronounce it, pen testing as a service platform. The PTAS approach uses a platform to drive pen testing efficiencies by productizing old workflows and harnessing the power of a selectively sourced global talent pool, offering creative findings and actionable results. It has been adopted by over 200 innovative companies like Credit Karma, MuleSoft, GoDaddy, and HubSpot. I'll begin with you, Richard. What do you think of that pitch? I, I, I think it's one of the things that's like pen testing has been around as long as the, pretty much security as it started they you plugged the first computer into the internet it was pen tested pretty quickly afterwards um, on that side of it and I think it's one of the things is that it really is the same thing that you went back to the 80s to do in most cases is if I went out and the old school was okay I developed and it's me developed a scope of work or worked in conjunction with the reseller developed that work and then brought it in 
they would go spend some amount of work effort and at the end you get a report now if you look at that and go okay how many people were involved how good were they or anything else i think from a platform and the yeah, crowdsourcing we've seen it work with bug bounty programs it's bound to work with uh pen testing programs i get people that are really specific and i can actually get kind of the best of breed pen testers for what I'm trying to test against. At the same time, I always hated waiting for two to three weeks to get a report for me mm -hmm. to be able to have something to finish. So if they're able to produce something that says, hey, in real time, you can actually see what's actually going on, or I have the report or the findings in real time with what's actually there, I can, I can actually get those things started to get fixed instead of waiting for a report, hopefully to land on my desk and then go and say, okay, now I gotta assign this work effort for this. Or they go, we found this really bad thing. And it's like, great, you should have told me like three weeks ago so that I could have fixed it beforehand on that side of it. So I think, yeah, I think it's a new twist. And I think if it's done correctly, it could be something that's successful. So, so I, can I say that you kind of like this pitch, yes? Yes. Okay, Mike, how do you feel? Yeah, I think I'd agree. I, I, I kind of like this pitch. Um, you know, I, I feel like it needs maybe one or two more sentences to just expand upon some of the points. You know, I look at this. Well, I did, I did ask her to keep it okay, short and well, sweet. So I, I mean, I'm, sure she could, I'm sure she could talk a lot more on this. <laughs> well, so maybe, maybe she could talk two more sentences, right? Because um, okay. it, it, it... What would, you, what would she add well, to it, this? Well, it just... Right now, it kind of comes across almost as too good to be true. So I'd like to understand a little bit more about how they're sourcing talent, how I would decide what talent would actually work on my penetration testing engagements. What are the old workflows that they're talking about? Just two sentences around, around expanding those two points. It's time for Ask a CISO. All right, here's a question I know you've heard and dealt with kind of on a continual basis, and I hear it all the time too. This comes from Brad Green of Arctic World, excuse me, Arctic Wolf Networks. And he asks, how many tools, vendors, reseller partners do you leverage to meet your security objectives? How many of those do you consider strategic versus tactical? And are any of them non-replaceable? So it's a lot of questions in there, but it really, I think it has to do with how big is your suite of tools you're dealing with and you know how, how are you sort of managing them all yeah so I, I tend to go best you know best of breed rather than looking for you know perhaps I've got one vendor I'm gonna then try and implement all of their product lines I, I don't offhand uh, have a count of tools vendors reseller partners but is is it over two dozen may I ask uh probably not actually um okay. And uh, frankly, part of that is because we tend to build rather than buy. That's just in our nature as an engineering org. But at the same time, even if I had over two dozen, I wouldn't be too bothered with it as long as each of them were important, were solving a particular problem, and I had some way of making them all talk to each other. That's it's that last part that's I think is the missing link. And if you have all of your tools talking with each other. If you have a common API, common consoles, common data feeds, the number of vendors actually doesn't really matter so much. And it gives you a flexibility to pick the best of breed products out there. So let me, let me just sort of be devil's advocate on that. One of the complaints I've heard of doing the best of breed approach is that the integration becomes a nightmare. Do you feel it's a nightmare or not a nightmare? I, I don't feel it's a nightmare. I feel that it's actually worth it. I, I would rather have a product that's solving my problems as best as is possible that might, you know, that initial integration work, there might be a, a mountain to climb, but once you get that integration uh, up and working, it takes some maintenance, but oftentimes the non best of breed product, they have management issues anyway. And so you're not necessarily trading one problem for another. Richard? I, I think Mike's on the right ever. I, I can get the number uh, on ours. We have 37 different vendors that we deal with for, for products on that. And we do do the best of breed, even to the point of even niche approaches for things. I think to your question that was there was how does integration 
work. And I think the product vendors now, especially on the security side, have gone away from the, I'm really sorry, but this is our secret sauce and we can't let anybody uh, see how we're doing this to their logging and their other capabilities are all now very open API, very robust in nature, and they're easy to integrate with out of the box for the most places of that. Some even provide capability to work with some of your logging infrastructure at a, at a, at a root level that's there. So I think the tools have gotten much better about the integration. It hasn't been on the developer side, and I think that has to do with a lot of people pushing it. And then as the new vendors come into the marketplace, this is like one of the requirements. You have to work with the following. That's just kind of a need to have. And I think from that perspective, that was a big standpoint that's, that's on there. As far as like any large organization or even medium organization, you have a vendor team that does the management uh, typically for the for the product sets and things around that. It's now just a relationship management features, additional functionality that's requested and things like that. Those are those are easy discussions to actually have. So I I, I don't see it uh, as a hindrance or I'm spending X amount of full time employees times on trying to do this in my environment. It, there there's relatively a very 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 small a component of that that's that's not really expensed uh, in any way, shape, or form on that. Excellent point. Well, let's close out the show. I want to thank Richard Rushing uh, for joining us today. Uh, Richard, uh, is there anything you'd like to plug about Motorola or anything you want to sort of a call out to the community? Sure. The standard call outs for security. Uh, thanks a lot. You could find me on LinkedIn or on Twitter at Secrich. And also, if you're looking for mobile devices, Motorola makes some of the best in the world. They're easily available from all the major carriers as well. And, and let me ask you this. Are you hiring security talent? We always are hiring security talent. Okay. <laughs> and Mike, are you hiring still security talent? Yeah, the, the answer to that question is always yes. Okay. So yes, uh, we're hiring, uh, especially right now, looking for assurance analysts, compliance, people with a compliance background. Also, a uh, special thank you, Richard. I uh, really appreciate you joining us. I've, uh, I've actually been a big fan of yours on LinkedIn. So it was uh, a pleasure to be able to sit down and have you on the podcast and uh, hear more about your thoughts. Uh, thanks for inviting me. And uh, again, it's a pleasure. And uh, again, I, I can say the same thing from you. I, I've been a fan uh, on your post and I think we, we've, we've, we've uh, uh, traded links back and forth on articles that uh, we've commented on. So I, I always do appreciate your insights uh, as well. And the same with you, David, as well. Well, thank you. It's a big love fest here at the CISO Security <laughs> Vendor Relationship Podcast. Thank, thank We're you all both. fans of everyone. Yes. And we're fans of the audience. That's the most important thing. We're fans of the people who listen to the podcast, who comment on it, who leave reviews. We, we love you. So thank you very much for listening. That wraps up another episode. If you haven't subscribed to the podcast, please do. If you're already a subscriber, write a review. We eagerly seek your input for the show. Send us vendor pitches you'd like us to critique. Ask us CISO questions and hot security discussions. If you're interested in sponsoring the show, contact David Spark at sparkmediasolutions.com. Thank you for listening to the CISO Security Vendor Relationship Podcast.